Welcome to the 1920s, one of the most innovative times in history. Hair dryers hit the market, and for the first time, traffic lights regulate the enormous number of automobiles on city streets. Broadcast radio is expanding, and for stores that sell radios, business is booming. While everyday Joes huddle around boxy radios to listen to college football games, and teenagers make their own crystal radios, those who could afford them are buying radios, equivalent to today's home entertainment systems. This is an Atwater Kent Model 20C from 1925. In the day, this cost about $70 plus accessories. You had to buy the tubes separately, you had to buy batteries, you had to buy a speaker, and they'd probably sell you an antenna kit as well. So by this point, you're pushing $200 and you have to multiply by about 10 or 11 to understand what that means in today's money. The radio contains five vacuum tubes. This is so-called 201A. You'll notice it has longer pins on the bottom. And you'll notice that this tube is all silvery. That's because it has a coating of barium on the inside of it, which is the so-called getter. It takes the last traces of oxygen out of the vacuum in the tube. And uh, this was very successful. Most of these 90-year-old tubes still work just fine. Let's take a look inside this radio. Signal moves from left to right in most of these things. We have a tuned circuit here that gets adjusted to the desired frequency. That radio frequency signal gets amplified by a tube, hits another tuned circuit, another radio frequency amplifier, and a third tuned circuit. And then the signal goes to the detector, which makes the radio frequency signals you can't hear into audio that you can. And then two additional audio amplifier stages to get enough amplification to drive the loudspeaker. To actually make the tubes work, the energy they control comes from a high voltage B battery. This would, in fact, says radio B battery. Gives you 45 volts, and you'd often have two or three of these connected in series. You probably had to replace these every couple of months, depending upon how heavily you use the radio. Output is by way of a horn speaker over here. In the base of the horn, there is essentially an earphone element, and then the flared nature of the horn matches the sound out to the air so that it's loud and you can hear it. We'll turn this set on. You'll notice there's a slight delay after you pull the switch until the volume comes up. This is while the filaments are coming up to operating temperature. We have two radio frequency amplifiers and a detector, each one of which is tuned, and so you have to adjust each of these knobs for maximum output. And you can adjust volume over here. Now, because of the way these dials are just labeled 0 to 100 and they don't match up to each other, if you want to find your way back to another station, it's a good idea to log it and in fact, the manufacturers and the radio stores provide log forms and you would write down the numbers so you could tune in to a different station easily. The common thing was to gather around the radio after dinner and listen to the programs. Of course, there were programs during the day uh, oriented to housewives, etc. So the radio might be on for a considerable number of hours a, a day. In the 1920s, broadcast radio was surrounded by excitement with promotional photographs and advertisements. But it was still new, barely regulated, and hard to tune in. Less than half of all American households had a radio by 1930. But by World War II, over 80% could easily listen to national and international news, sports, and entertainment. A cultural shift had begun.